building on the insights of his best-selling book, 52 Weeks with Jesus, Dr. James Merritt has written a brand new devotional to bring renewal to all who want more of Jesus, a great companion devotional or perfect on its own. Spend time with the one who changed everything. Get your copy of 52 Weeks with Jesus devotional from Touching Lives for $13 or get both books for just $20. Call 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. Today on Touching Lives. Every husband is to be a band that stretches around his wife and stretches around his children and stretches around his family and says to them, with every breath I have, I'm going to protect you and provide for you and preserve you because that's what a knight in shining armor does. So you're sitting there and you're saying, wow, I, that's pretty heavy stuff. Oh, wait a minute. You say, okay, I, I, I want to lead like Jesus, and I want to love like Jesus, but I'm telling you, it's hard. How do you really get there? Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. It doesn't take a lot of work to have a bad marriage. It takes a lot of work to have a good one. And the reason why marriage is hard work is because, first of all, it involves people. Second reason it's hard work is because it involves people who carry into that marriage two totally different sets of expectations. Because here's our problem. The vast majority of people that walk into a marriage go into that marriage majoring not on what they want to give to the marriage, but they major on what they want to get out of the marriage. And here's what happens so often. When we don't get from the marriage what we think we should, we quit giving to the marriage what we know we ought. When we quit getting from the marriage what we think we should, we quit giving to the marriage what we know that we ought. When we discover that the marital rose has thorns and the marital road has bumps and the shining, knight, the shining armor on the night has lost its luster and the fairest of them all is not so fair at 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> we tend to do one of three things. One, we lash out. We get in a tug of war over whose expectations are going to be met. We fight on who's going to get their way. And all of a sudden, we wake up one morning and every day's a battle. We're fighting over something different. Or sometimes we fight over the same thing over and over and over. And it's like one gigantic tug of war. I'm going to get my way. No, I'm going to get my way. No, I'm going to get my way. No, I'm going to get mine. And all your marriage is is a movement from one conflict to the next. We lash out. Then at other times, we stand down. That is, one person just finally throws up their hands and says, I give up. Go ahead, have your way, whatever. I'm, I'm just, I'm tired of arguing. I'm tired of fighting. You just go ahead. We'll do it your way. And here's what happens in that situation 100% of the time. That person clams up. Communication shuts down. Personal engagement comes to a screeching halt. And the problem with that is personal engagement is what got you married, and personal engagement is what's going to keep you married. So that doesn't work either. So when that doesn't work, finally, too many people take off. We give up, we quit, we file, we abdicate, we negotiate, and we separate. We walk out of the marriage, and then here's the problem. What do we do? We try to find somebody else. Start all over again. Well, that, okay, you weren't the right one. There's got to be the right one out there. And the problem is you're going to walk into the second marriage with the same stinking baggage you walked in with the first marriage. And the person that you are getting married to, I promise you, they're carrying baggage with them as well. So none of these three things work. Lashing out won't work. Standing down won't work. Walking out doesn't work. So the, the issue is, so then what do you do? Well, the reason why these three things don't work is very simple. It's what I told you last week. It's our key takeaway. The key to having a marriage that ends happily ever after is not in finding the right person. It is in being the right person. There's never been a marriage in the history of the world. Listen to this. There has never been a marriage in the history of the world ever that did not end up happily ever after when two things were true. When the wife was the wife that God wanted her to be, and the husband was the husband that God wanted him to be. You put those two things together, it's fail-safe, it is foolproof, you're going to have a marriage that ends happily 
ever after. And the prescription for being those people is found in a book that we were in last week. If you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Get your iPad or iPhone out, whatever you use. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, just by way of review, if you, in case you missed last week, or if you were here, just again by way of review, last week we spoke specifically to the wife. We started off with the wife. And I reminded you that the reason why we did that is because that's who Paul started with, okay? Good news is today it's the husband's turn. All right? Now, before I do that, let me go back and kind of review in case you missed it. When Paul talks to the wife, he says to the wife, if you want to be the wife that God wants you to be, and if you want to maximize your potential to have a happy husband and a happy marriage, he said there are two things you've got to do. He said, number one, you've got to submit to the authority of Jesus. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to get your heart right with Jesus, not to your husband, to Jesus. You've got to make up your mind that you're, going to will, you're willing to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I just want to be the wife that you want me to be. That's all. That's my whole goal. So I want to surrender my wifehood to you. You submit to the authority of Jesus. Number two, you support the leadership of your husband. And I told you last week, the, mo the, the, number, the, 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 the most important thing to a man in a marriage, by far, by far, every survey I've ever read says this, number one thing in a marriage, even above sex, is respect. A husband craves respect from his spouse. More than anything else, if she respects me, I can handle anything. If I know I've got her vote of confidence, I can handle anything. If I know she's got my back, I can handle anything. If I know she's behind me, I can handle anything. So now here's the good news for you ladies who were here last week. You, you know, you've, been, you've been counting the minutes to this service. Okay, here's the good news. It's important to note that Paul takes more time and Paul gives more space to what he says to the husband than what he does to the wife. As a matter of fact, if you want to count it up, you can do this. He takes three times more verses to say to the husband what he said to the wife. So gentlemen, start your engines. Because if you do what Paul tells you to do, what I'm going to share with you in this little message, you're going to maximize your potential to have a happy wife. You're going to maximize your potential to have a marriage that ends happily ever after. All right? There are three things. Paul gave the wife two things to do. He gives the husband three things to do. He says, number one, I want you to lead like Jesus. This is what Paul says. I want you to lead like Jesus. Now, before Paul tells husbands what to do, he tells them why to do it. Ephesians 5 verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, I told you last week, the word head means, it means authority. However, being an authority does not mean being an authoritarian. There's nothing in the Bible that says a husband has the, wife to the, the, the right to bully his wife, boss his wife, intimidate his wife, scream at his wife, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, kind of, you know, lord it over his wife. There's nothing in this passage that says you ought to be a drill sergeant. We're to be the same kind of leader to our wives that Jesus is to the church. And I'll tell you what you'll find out about Jesus. Go read the four gospels. Here's what you'll find. Jesus never forced anybody to do anything. He never twisted anybody's arm. He never screamed at anybody, never intimidated anybody, never pulled rank, never forced anybody to do anything. I've been a follower of Jesus for many, many, many years. And every morning I get up with the same attitude in my heart. I lovingly follow him. I willingly follow him. I gladly follow him. I can't wait to follow him because he has never one time ever forced me to do anything. He does not lead that way. He doesn't do that. The way you lead your wife is the way Jesus leads the church. Jesus doesn't bully the church. He doesn't intimidate the church. He doesn't pull rank on the church. He doesn't shove his weight around with the church. But what he did do was this. Jesus did, guys, give us the key on how to be the kind of leader that your wife would love to follow. And you ready for this? The key to leadership is service. The key to leadership is service. I think everybody in this room would agree, I hope you would, the greatest leader who ever lived is Jesus. I mean, he started a movement today that has about 3 billion followers. I'd say that's pretty good leadership, right? I mean, the greatest leader who ever lived. Now, he said something absolutely mind-boggling in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Time out. You're the son of God. Yep. You're the king of kings. Yep. You're the Lord of Lords. Yep. 
You created the universe. Yep. You spoke the world into existence. Yep. And I'm not to serve you. No, I came to serve you. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate that forbidden fruit and God came calling. Well, who sinned first? Eve. Who ate the fruit first? Eve. Who did God call on first? Adam. Adam, where are you? And let me just tell every man in this room, if your marriage is not working out, if your marriage is there's something wrong and it's not really hitting on all eight cylinders, if Jesus comes knocking at the door of your house, your wife may answer the door, but the first thing Jesus is going to say is, is the husband home? I need to talk to him. I need to deal with him because we are the guys primarily responsible for making sure that that marriage is a happy marriage. Why? Because we're the leader. That's our calling, and we're to lead like Jesus. Well, that raises a question. How do you lead like Jesus? Well, the way to lead like Jesus is to love like Jesus. You love like Jesus. Now, husbands, listen very carefully. Paul's already told us what we are. We're the head of the home, right? But now he tells us, okay, you're the leader, guys. Let me tell you how to lead. Here's what we're going to find out. Husbands lead their wives by loving their wives. Now, let me tell you what Paul does. He, I, I'm, and I'm glad Paul's doing this, okay? Paul wants us to get it so bad, and he knows some husbands are pretty thick in the head, okay? He understands that. So let me tell you what Paul does. He takes six verses and 105 words to tell us husbands, this is how I want you to love her. This is how I want you to love your wife. And so let's just notice something right up front. Let's get this out of the way. Love is not an emotion. Love is an action. It's not a feeling. It's not an, ocean, uh, an emotion. It is an act. And verse 25 says it all. Listen, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, for her. And while you're reading that verse, that is not a request. That is not a suggestion. That is in the imperative mood. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, if you had been sitting there 2,000 years ago in this city called Ephesus and you'd been a husband, you would have fallen out of your chair because you talk about something cutting edge. You talk about something absolutely revolutionary. You understand this was a culture where husbands did love their wives, but let me tell you how a husband was expected to love his wife. He loved her with an eros kind of love, an erotic kind of love. He was to have sex with his wife. That's one reason he got married. He would love her with a phylos kind of love, a friendship kind of love. He was to be friends with his wife. That is not the word that Paul uses there. He doesn't use eros. He doesn't use phylos. He uses a word that we know as agape, and he uses it six times. And agape is the kind of love, now watch this, that you give to someone regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done, regardless of whether you even like them or not. It is love that is given to the unlovable. It is love that's given to the undeserving. We're not asked to love, we're commanded to love. It's not an act, it is an act of the will, it's not a feeling of the emotion. And this is the kind of love that says, I don't care what you do to me, I'm going to love you. I don't care if I don't like you, I'm going to love you. I don't care if I don't feel in love with you, I'm going to love you. That's the kind of love that he's talking about. And we are, Paul said, we are to love our wives the way Jesus loved the church. Well, that raises a question. So how do we know that Jesus loved the church? Well, we're told he loved the church so much, he gave himself for it. So every husband in this room, if you say you love your wife, let's just take a little test. Here's a little question you can ask yourself, and then you can tell me whether or not you really love your wife. Do you love your wife so much that you're not just willing to live for her, you're willing to die for her? And here's the goal of that kind of love, verse 26. Watch this. This is, this is, just, this is so rich that he might sanctify her. This is what Jesus is doing for us, that he might sanctify her, 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 having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now watch this. This is what Paul said. Jesus said, uh, Paul said, Jesus loves the church so much. Here's what he's doing right now. While I'm standing on this platform, here's what he's doing. Jesus is working overtime to help us to be what we need to be and to help us to become what we ought to become. Husband, let me tell you something. Your number one job as a husband is not to get your wife to be the wife you want her to be. That's not your job. Your number one job as a husband is not to force, intimidate, manipulate, talk her into giving you what you want out of that marriage. That's not your job. 
Your number one job as a husband is to help your wife be everything that God wants her to be and to become the person that God wants her to be. Your job is not to drag your wife down. Your job is to build your wife up. And then you know what Paul does? He just keeps digging deeper. Look what he says in verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, that's kind of weird. Why does Paul bring our bodies into it? I mean, all of a sudden, he's talking about marriage. He says, oh, by the way, guys, while we're on the subject, how about your body? How about just loving your wife like you love your body? Why does Paul say that? Because Paul knows that health, our health, the health of our body is foundational to everything we do. It's really sad to see so many people. I've seen it in all, all my ministry. So many people fail to realize that health is a lot more important than wealth. And someone has observed that too many people spend all of their health trying to accumulate their wealth, and then they spend all of their wealth trying to get their health back. And, and it's really true. And if you put your happiness ahead of your health, you'll be unhappy. And, and guys, there's one thing that all of us in this room have in common. Let's just be honest. We love our bodies. We do. Because every day, there's one thing we make sure we do for our bodies every day. We make sure we satisfy our bodies. So when we're hungry, we feed it. When we're full, we burp it. <laughs> when it's thirsty, we water it. When it itches, we scratch it. When it's dirty, we bathe it. When it's tired, we rest it. When it's bored, we entertain it. And we don't mind sacrificing anything for the good of our body. And so Paul comes along and says, hey, I got an idea, guys. Why don't you love her like you love you? Why don't you love your wife like you love your body? You, you'll get up early in the morning and go hit the gym. You'll, you, you, you love her, you know, you, you'll get up in the morning and you'll go do this exercise or that and you'll watch this. You'll, why don't you love her like you love your body? And then Paul just goes even deeper. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Big words, nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. He said, listen, the word nourish, you know what that word means in the original Greek language? It's the word that's used for the way a mother looks after a baby. The word cherish, you know what that word means? It refers to a bird's nest. It refers to the way that a mother bird looks after her chicklets. It, 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 was, it, was just, it, it, it sometimes was used for the word body heat, the way a mother would warm her chicklets. And what Paul is saying is, guys, your love for your wife means two things. You're going to provide for them. You're going to protect them. If you really love your wife, let me tell you this, guys. If you really love your wife, there's one feeling your wife will never have, insecurity. There's one thing your wife will have every day of her life. She will be stable and secure. She's got, she'll know, I know you're going to provide for me. I know you're going to protect me. By the way, you guys ever thought about what the word husband literally means? You know where that word comes from? The word husband comes from the Anglo-Saxon word house band. Every husband is to be a band that stretches around his wife and stretches around his children and stretches around his family and says to them, with every breath I have, I'm going to protect you and provide for you and preserve you because that's what a knight in shining armor does. So you're sitting there and you're saying, wow, I, that's pretty heavy stuff. Oh, wait a minute. You say, okay, I, I, I want to lead like Jesus and I want to love like Jesus, but I'm telling you, it's hard. How do you really get there? Well, the way you lead like Jesus and love like Jesus is you live like Jesus. Now, we're going to wrap this up. Watch this. About the time you think you get Paul figured out in this passage, he just takes off on a whole different tangent. Now, watch this. He's talking about marriage, and now in the very next verse, he makes a beeline to the book of Genesis. He says in verse 31, therefore, therefore, what do you mean therefore? You've been talking about a man and his body. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does Paul go all the way back to the first marriage? This is talking about the first marriage. Why does Paul go all the way back to the first marriage to talk about our marriage? Okay? You remember I told you that I was going to tell you two things that I want you to remember if you don't remember anything else I say? I've already told you the first one. doesn't take a lot of work to have a bad marriage. It takes a lot of work to have a good one. All right. Here's the second one I'm going to tell you. You won't understand your marriage if you don't get what I'm about to tell you. And you won't understand why marriage, every marriage is a big deal to God if you don't understand what I'm about to tell you. Though This is big. Marriage is a covenant relationship. 
And I'm going to explain that. But marriage is a covenant relationship. Paul says the husband is to hold. You see those words, hold fast? Do you know what that word literally means in the, in the Greek language? That word literally means to unite through a covenant, to unite through an oath, to unite through a sacred binding promise. Now watch this. Malachi 2.14 says this. Your wife, he's talking about your wife, your wife is your companion and your wife by, can y'all read that word? What's that word? Covenant. It's not contract with a 30-day out. It's not commitment. Well, I'm just not committed anymore. Forget it. She is your companion and your wife by covenant. When a man and a woman get married, they make a covenant promise to God and a covenant promise to each other. And when they consummate that marriage on their honeymoon night, when they become one flesh, they seal that covenant. Now we're going to get to the crux of the issue. Why is this so important? Watch this. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, 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 bottom line. You will never understand your marriage. You think you do, you don't. You think your marriage is all about having sex, having kids, sharing the bills, you vacuum, I go to work, or you work and I vacuum, whatever it may be, and we just kind of have this partner. Stop. That's, that's, no, 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 no. That's not what marriage is really all about. Paul says, Marriage at its deepest level. This is why it's such a big deal to God. You ready? Marriage is to be a carbon Xerox copy of the relationship that Jesus has to the church. My marriage to Teresa and her marriage to me, we are to, we are to be a picture to the people that live in our neighborhood. This is what Christ and the church looks like. This is the kind of relationship that Christ has to the church. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's where we're going to really get to it. Why do we even have a church? Why are we even here today? Why is it that I have a personal relationship with God? Why do I have eternal life? Why have I been forgiven of all of my sins? Why do I know that if I were to drop dead on this step right now, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I would be in heaven with God? Why do I know all those things? Only one reason. God keeps his promise. God keeps his covenant. When God makes a covenant, God keeps his end of the bargain. When God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. You go all the way back to the Old Testament. God makes a covenant with Adam. God makes a covenant with Abraham. God makes a covenant with Moses. God makes a covenant with David. He said, I promise you guys, I promise you, I'm going to send someone that's going to redeem you. I'm going to send someone that's going to forgive you. I'm going to send someone that's going to change you. I'm going to send someone that's going to allow you to have a permanent relationship with me. And what Paul is simply saying is this, just like God keeps his promise, we ought to keep ours. So here's how Paul concludes this whole matter. Listen to this. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And the implied conclusion is, and you will live happily ever after. So here's how we're going to end it. He said, husbands, you're kind of like Christ in this deal. And wives, you're kind of like the church in this deal. Husbands, you're kind of the head in this deal. And wives, you're, you're kind of the body in this deal. And husbands, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love your wife the way I love the church. Wives, I want you to submit to your husband the way the church submits to me. And here's the bottom line. When a husband loves Jesus more than he loves his wife, He'll love the, his wife the way he ought to love his, his wife. And when she, and he'll be the knight in shining armor, and when the wife respects the husband the way the church respects Jesus, she will be the fairest of them all, and they can live happily ever after. So here's where we're coming to. Here's the decision everybody in this room has got to make. So you're in a rotten marriage. So she changed. So he changed. So she's not today what she was on the night you married her, and he's not what he was on the night you married him. 
So she's developed these habits and he's developed these habits. And she's disappointed you and you've disappointed her. And he's blown it with you and she's blown it with you. Okay, I get all that. Now, here's what it boils down to. If you keep saying, until you turn into the right person, we're not going to be happy. I got news for you. You're not going to be happy. Until you turn into the right person, this marriage is not going to work. I got news for you. The marriage is not going to work. But when a husband gets his eyes off of his, off his wife and quits looking out the window and looks in the mirror and looks up to heaven and says, God, I am done with her worrying with her. I'm done. It's not even my job. God, let me be the husband I need to be. And beginning today, I'm going to love her the way Jesus loves the church. And when a wife says, you know what, nagging has gotten me nowhere. I'm not ever going to change him. I'm never going to force him or coerce him or intimidate him to be what I want him to be. And it's not even my job. But Lord, beginning today, I'm going to be the wife that you want me to be. And I'm going to respect him the same way that Jesus is respected by his church. I am giving everybody in this room a money back guarantee you can live happily ever after. Having unrealistic expectations can doom a marriage before it even begins. And over time, the frustration and hurt can grow until you think the only answer is to walk away. Don't give up, there's still hope. If your marriage has hit rough waters, call Touching Lives today at 800-413-1131. Let's pray together and ask God for the wisdom to help right your ship. Hey, I want to tell you about an upcoming event with one of the best buddies I've got on the planet, Greg Laurie, that you do not want to miss. This event is called the Harvest America webcast. This has the potential to be one of the largest evangelistic events in American history. And my dear buddy Greg is going to give a straightforward gospel presentation and a call for people to come to Christ. And we believe God is going to do a great, great work. There's going to be special music by Chris Tomlin, Mercy Me, and Switchfoot. It's going to be fantastic. So to find out more, or if you'd like to host the showing of this event as it happens, you can go to their website. It's harvestamerica.com. That's harvestamerica.com. The sad reality is that there are countless people who tune into Touching Lives who are struggling with troubled marriages. We hear from people who say they had all but given up when the Lord encouraged them through a message they heard through our programming. And it's your faithful prayers and financial support that help us help those who need it most. 